Hi there and welcome to the let's play of Champions of Kryn. I'm Baron and I actually rigged up a batch file to fire that game up quite easily by hitting A. Those are some nice tunes, although they are cut short. And if you really want to know uh, what I did with the badge file, you can pause the video. I didn't use the echo off command, so you can see the commands I actually um, sort of typed in there. And here we get to choose between play and demo. Demo sort of is the introduction to the game, so we start with that. And that guy here is Tarnus. So apparently you explore cities in this game. You might go on a shopping spree. You might get a good night's sleep. And my guess is evil is about to strike right now in form of a green dragon. Here we actually have our party. It only consists of three people. You can have six regular party members and two additional ones. And now um, a battle will unfold. Those actually are real. Uh, somebody's turning the undead here. Uh, this actually is a real battle. Those are real uh, dice rolls in the background. That means... Um, fuck. He breathes poison. That's not good. Uh, that means if you play the intro again, you might not get the same results. Sometimes your party wins, sometimes your party loses. It really depends on the rolls of the dice. Sis. So we sort of have a knight here. A spellcaster and a thief, uh, both of them are probably multi-class characters, both can cast spells. Um, the knight has a dragon lance, that's why he's doing a truckload of damage. The bad thing, those dragonians, those bozak dragonians, when they die they explode and hurt everybody that's around them. But the party prevailed. But then again, it doesn't have to be like that. Uh, Sir Ringward cut it quite close here. And we get the nice tunes again. And that's quite important here. You see a sword, a crown and a rose on that picture. That actually uh, represents the three orders of knights in this game. Okay, so how about we start the game? Uh, the Champions of Kryn actually is the first part of a trilogy. Uh, the second game would be Death Knights of Kryn and the third game would be 
the Dark Queen of Kryn. And you can import your characters from the first game into the second and from the second into the third game. So you actually have to think a bit uh, when you want to create a party here because not all class and um, race combinations are actually without a level limitation. There, is a, there are several level caps implemented in the game so you might be careful you might want to be careful that you don't choose a class uh, race combination that actually experiences a level cap quite early because then you won't get any more experience and won't be able to you know develop your character anymore so keep that in mind when we create a party now there are several races. One, two, three, four, six, I think. Two, four, no. Five, six, seven, actually. You have two elves. You have an half elf. You have two dwarves, a candle, and a human. The silver and the elf. Well, the elves are pretty much standard. As all the elves are in most fantasy games, they are can get very, very old. They are a little arrogant. Um, quite agile, they get a bonus if they use long swords and short swords and bows and stuff. They are quite immune to sleep and charm spells. They can detect secret doors and stuff. They're really good. Uh, but the problem with elves is that uh, they can't be raised from the dead once they actually buy the farm. Half elves, there's nothing special about half elves. Uh, they have human and elvish parents they have some resistances against uh, sleep and charm spells you have two types oh yeah again the silver nasty elves are more of a recluse the quality nasty elves are more open uh, to contact with other races and societies you have two kind of dwarves here you have the mountain dwarves and the hill dwarves pretty much standard dwarves again the mountain dwarves are more recluse the hill dwarves are more open minded the Candors are sort of the equivalent to the um, Halfling in standard D&D. They are quite small, agile, curious and they have one special ability or better the lack thereof. They cannot for the very life of them experience fear. It's just physically not possible. Candors cannot be afraid. It can be an advantage sometimes, can be a disadvantage sometimes. And they really tend to get on people's nerves easily. And humans are pretty average, there's nothing special about them. So you have to uh, think when you want to create a party. As always, I like to create single class characters because I like how they um, progress through the levels faster. But then again, you have to you know you don't they don't have that variety of abilities and you must make sure that uh, you don't pick a race class combination that experiences a level cap because then that character would be screwed so we start with a human female it's going to be a knight although i guess a female knight would be a lady or something i don't know but the only class uh, the only race that can be a knight as class would be a human, uh, that's sort of the equivalent to the paladin, although in later games there are paladins too. Yeah, well, doesn't matter. And you have to be lawful good. I will not reroll the stats because I will modify them anyway. So yeah, as you can see, this character is a knight of the crown now. We had this crown, the rose and the sword, the crown, the order of the crown is the lowest ranking order of the knights. If she uh, rises through the levels and has decent stats, she can become a Knight of the Sword, and eventually she might even become a Knight of the Rose, which would be the highest ranking order. So her name is... Rekel Dorian. You might remember her from my Let's Play of Diablo 1, where she's back in Champions of Kryn, and this time she's a Knight. And I will not bother with her icon, I think it's okay. Uh, they don't really have that many female icons, so well, skip it. Yeah, that's cool, save it. We create another character. This time it will be a dwarf. Yeah, I like to have at least of all the main races, a character of all the main races in my party. Um, 
I don't really know. I've never played that game. I, well, I've played a, an hour or two to familiarize myself with the controls a bit, but that's pretty much it. That actually is the first time I'm trying my hands on a on a gold box game. I never played those. I'm not that old. Um, but I always liked the Dragon's Land, Dragonlands books, uh, the Chronicles of the Dragonlands, the Legends of the Dragonlands. And that always fascinated me when I was a kid, and I always wanted to play those games. And well, now I'm actually doing that. And yes, I so I I don't really know whether it is useful, but I think that it might be useful to have at least one elf and one dwarf and one candor in the party, just because maybe they come in. We come into a situation where it's useful to have a certain race. Maybe we come across a scroll that is written in Elvish or an inscription on a wall in a mine that is written in the Dwarven language or some NPCs will only interact with other NPCs of their same race, I don't know. So I will have uh, at least one Elf, one Dwarf, one Candle, one Human and stuff in my party. So if you want to pick a Dwarf, I think it makes more sense to pick a Hill Dwarf because, well, they have more contact with other races and if there's a a party, uh, a dwarf in a non-dwarven party, it's probably gonna be a hill dwarf. A mountain dwarf would probably prefer a pure dwarven party. So this will be the only male character in the party. He will be a fighter, because the fighter is the only class that re uh, experiences no level cap in the Dark Queen of Kryn. So he will be neutral good. I will not reroll the stats. And that is Randy Spears. Eh, I might wanna change his weapons a bit. So I don't confuse him. <laughs> Cat of the skirt, man. Take off the skirt. Wait, was that an axe? Do you have a bigger one? I wanna give him an axe, so uh, he looks... Well, he's easier to differentiate between easy to differentiate between the knight and the fighter. Or, oh, since he's called Randy Spears, uh, let's give him a spear. I thought I, I saw a spear here somewhere. There it is. Keep it. Exit. Exit. And it's nice. Thank you. Alrighty. The next character will be... Um, a man, what would it be? I think it will. Mm. Yeah, I think it will be a human. That will probably be for the best. So it will be a human, a female, and this will be a cleric actually. And uh, if you are a cleric, you have to follow a god. So you can't be a general cleric, you have to worship a special god. You have one, two, three, four good gods and three neutral gods. You can't be an, an evil ca character in this game. Okay. And you actually get uh, special advantages for, f you know, being a follower of a god. So let's see. We have Paladine. If you are a cleric of Paladine, you get an additional protection from evil 10-foot radio spell. If you are a follower of Magir, you can turn undead as if uh, you were a cleric that is actually two levels higher than you actually are. And you get an additional silence 15 foot radius spell. If you are a cleric of Kirin Jolith, you get a Tycho plus one. Mm, very useful. And an extra spell detect magic. Mishakal being the god goddess of healing, I, uh, she grants her followers a plus one to all her healing spells. And you get an additional Charm Person, Remove Curse and Bless spell. You have the neutral god Syrian, who gives his uh, clerics a Burning Hand skill, uh, spell. That's nice, so uh, you have a, a, a Mage spell and a Attack spell. Rearx being the god of the Dwarves, grants his followers Attack of plus 1 if they happen to be Dwarves. That means, on the other hand, if you are, if you create a Dwarven Cleric, it has to be a Cleric of Rearx. And if you happen to be a non-Dwarven Cleric of Rex, you don't get any bonuses. That sucks, I guess. And the neutral god of Shinare grants his followers a Charm Person spell. So this will be a Magia Cleric here. So she can turn undead as proficiently as possible. 
Again, neutral good. Well, we will not bother with re-rolling the stats because they will be modified anyway. And that is still your saint. And I do not like that icon. I will change it. First we change the head. No. Yeah, that looks like a woman's head. Keep that. And what could you give me with the weapons? Maybe a morning star or something. Yeah, how about that? Is that some morning star, right? Not an axe. Oh, what else do we have? That's a hammer. Okay, let's keep that. And yeah, I think we're good. Exit, exit. This icon is okay. Thank you. The next character will be... I don't think that we got a, an elf yet. Did we? No. So we'll create one now. It will be a Qualin as the elf because they are more likely to, you know, come into, into, into a non-elven party. Female. This will be a mage. And you have to be careful when you pick an alignment because there are two types of mages. But actually there are three types of mages. There are good mages, neutral mages and evil mages. But since you can't play evil characters, you cannot play evil mages. And yeah, that ac those mages actually are connected, or the power of the mages the powers of the mages are connected to the moons. So if you are a white, a good mage, you get your powers from the white moon, you wear a white robe. You have to be a good character. If you happen to be a neutral mage, you get your powers from the red moon, you happen to wear a red robe, and you are neutral. And if you are evil, you get your powers from the black moon, and well, you wear a black robe. So sh since well, there's actually a certain amount of spells, a pool of spells that all mages have access to. But then there are other spells that only mages of certain colors might learn. So there are special white mages spells and special red mages spells. That's why. So that's why it's good to have a red and a white mage in your party. This will be the white mage, so she will be neutral. Good. And see, it's a white mage. I will not reroll the stats and call her... Zara Whites. I think I will change that a bit. Since she's a white mage, she'll get that nice white robe. Okay. And now the second color arm. Um, thank you. Keep it. And we should give you a weapon too. No, not the change don't change the color of the weapon. Parts weapon. Yeah, it doesn't you if you don't don't have a weapon in your hands, you can't change the color. That should be obvious. Okay, we have a staff. That's cool. This icon is cool. Yes, I will save Sarah Whites. And we create another character. This time it will be a human again. Another female one. Again a mage. And this time it will be... She will be true neutral. Because she will be a red mage. I will not reroll the stats. And that is Genevieve Jolie. Again, we change the color. Red, uh, that's cool. That 
it's the same color I hope at least keep exit the second color legs thank you and arms So apparently she's a red rope, everybody can see that. And she gets a weapon too. Yeah, she gets a dagger. This icon is okay. And the last character will actually be a candor because we are still missing one of those. This will be the only multi-class character because we still need a thief. But then again, a pure thief is not that useful. And since I could use a second uh, cleric, I will make a cleric thief character here. The bad thing though is that the candor is, you know, he experiences a level cap in Dark Queen of Kryn. So um, if you have a multi class character, the experience is always divided. How one half goes into the cleric part and the other half goes into the thief part. But once uh, she reaches the thief level 12, she can't progress. Uh, no, the cleric level 12, she can't progress in that department anymore. So uh, half of her experience will then be wasted through the rest of the game series. That's bad. Uh, the, the thief part will not experience a level cap. Hmm. Yeah, well, can't be helped. So this time we picked Mishakal, the goddess of healing. Has to be neutral good. Neutral because it's a thief and, go thief and good because it's uh, Mishakal is a good goddess. I will not reroll the stats. That is Kobe Tai. And I will change her weapon because as a candle she should use the special candle weapon. That it is. Thank you. Keep it. Exit. Exit. Save. Yes. Okay, let's add our characters to the party. We start with Rekal Dorian, then comes Randy Spears. We then have Sylvia, Saint, Sarah White, Genevieve Julie, and Kobe Ty. Now we modify them. So, yeah. <laughs> Another bad thing is that if you happen to play female characters, which I have a lot in my party, um, you will realize that women are not as strong as men in this game. Can't be helped. So if you happen to play a female human warrior class character, she only gets a strength of 1850. That's her maximum. While a human male warrior class character would get 1899 or maybe even 1800. I don't know. Uh, sucks. The rest is standard. She gets a maximum of 28 hit points. So, Randy Spears being a male dwarf gets the maximum strength that is available for male dwarven fighters, 1899. Dexterity is kept at 17, but constitution goes up to 19, charisma stays at 12. But what mm, Dwarven fighter really needs charisma? So, Sylvia Saint, being a human non-fighter, non-warrior class, gets her 18 in every stat and 28 points. Thank you. Well, elves on the other hand, if you are a female elf, your strength is kept at 16. That's rather unfortunate. I, I I think constitution should be kept at 17, but somehow I can raise that to 18, but I'm not complaining here. So we keep that too. Again, we have a human. That means 18 everything. Thank you. Keep it. And finally, the candle. The candle strength is always kept at 16. It doesn't matter whether it's a male or a female. Um, Kanda. The wisdom is also kept at 16, which which sucks a bit for um, for cleric, 
but that can't be helped. I still think uh, Cleric Thief is more useful than just a pure thief. And that's it. The party is complete now. Um, that game of course comes with documentation. And in the Adventurer's Journal there actually is some sort of background information. Uh, that gives you a little bit of uh, knowledge, um, extra knowledge of what's going on in the game. It's quite helpful. It's presented in a sort of a letter, and I think it will be, it would be, would be good if I read it. So that's what I'm going to do. So you know what actually is going on in this game. So the letter was written by a knight by the name of Morthos Strongsword, and is addressed to the Circle of Knights. To the Circle of Knights. I, your humble servant, send you greetings. This missive is sent without the knowledge of my commandant and in violation of his orders. I take this action in full knowledge of the consequences it may bring upon me and through the convic conviction that in doing so I fulfill my oath. The commandant has been acting strange of late as if afflicted by some dark spell. I know that information of evil portents has not been forwarded to your august body as required by our carter. Many of our most faithful followers have died suddenly and mysteriously within this last fortnight. The commandant has been too ready with replacements for them, replacements which have an unclear feel. I ask that you send a knight of pure character and high stature to investigate my conduct and this report. As further evidence, I provide in its entirety a letter found on the body of Hal Horban, a ranger of the highest character. And here comes the letter of the ranger now, so this sort of is a letter within a letter concept. Dear Istan, far from annoying me, I find the greatest pleasure in responding to your inquiry, dear brother. It has been some time since I have turned my mind to the scholarly histories in which I formerly delighted. Your questions, questions regarding the relationship between the War of the Lands and these outposts provides a welcome diversion from my normal duties. But first a bit of background. Ancelon is a small continent stretching from the Arctic to the equa equatorial climates in the southern hemisphere of the world of Kryn. It was across the face of this troubled land that the War of the Lands raged in years past and brought our company to its present unhappy fate. In the 348th year after the Cataclysm, the evil forces of Tychesis, the Queen of Darkness launched a treacherous war she had long prepared in secret. Striking first north, east and then south, the armies of evil dragons, fell draconians and all manner of other evil beings quickly overran the unprepared and the unsuspecting. The good dragons, historical enemies of the evil dragons, could not ally themselves with the forces of good. As part of the Dark Queen's plan, their eggs were taken as hostage while the great beast slept. The good dragons' neutrality was the price they paid from to keep their eggs from harm. While the good forces' attempts to ally against the common threat were hampered by treachery and old feuds, the evil armies made good use of their time. Quickly consolidating their hold on the newly conquered lands, they struck west and even further south in the winter of 351 AC. It was in this year that a group of companions met at the inn of the last home and solace. The exploits of these companions are now well known, how they gained the discs of Mishakal and returned them with the first true cleric to walk the land since the Cataclysm. How their discovery that the Draconians were the result of the corruption of the good dragon eggs freed the good dragons from their pledge and brought them into the war on the side of good. How it helped Barum to return to the temple outside of Neraka and with his death close the portal that gave Tachesis an entry into Kryn. And that actually is the story as it happened in the Chronicles of the Dragonlands. It's a trilogy. Really enjoyed it a lot. It's a very good. Very good trilogy. Good books. It was at this time that many counted the war over. With their queen locked out of this world, the dragon armies lost their sense of direction. Many urged the good armies to return home and disband. Some were foolish enough to do so. But evil retained a strong, strong grip on much of the land. The corruption process was stopped, but the good eggs were not returned and the exploits of the companions had given evil yet a new form. Raistlin Megir, a companion with his brother Caramon, 
was caught up in the web of power that blazed through the land. While working against the Dark Queen's plans, his own grew ever more ambitious. By the time she was driven out of the land, his own robes, once a neutral red, became as black as his heart. Through long and macabre studies, he became convinced that he himself could become a god, not just a god, the most powerful of all gods. Through his plots and machinations, another foul time swept over Ancelon, this one threatening even more defilement than, than, than that caused by the dragon armies. It was only when Raistlin realized that if he persisted he would left, be left to rule a dead world that he relented. Caught up in his power struggle, evil, evil forces struck again. Kitiara, half-sister to Raistlin and the hero Caramon, organized an attack. Dragons, draconians, min and other evil creatures bypassed the High Clarist's tower and fell on Palanthas. The city would have stood against even these forces had it not been for the aid given by Lord Soth and his death knights. No one could stand before them as they swept through the city streets. In the very tower where Raistlin did battle with the Dark Queen, Kitiara fell. It is said that Lord Soth took her unwilling and undead body off to a fate far worse than a clean death. Whatever the reason, the Death Knights withdrew and could overthrew the invaders. And that is the story of the Legends of the Dragonlands. Also, trilogy also very enjoyable. With this lesson clear before them, all realized the evil threat could return at any time. With new resolve, the Alliance stood to arms again. Led by the Solemnic Knights, the good forces smashed through the remaining dragon armies. In a long and bitter campaign, the eastern lands were freed. The city of Sanction fell to a bloody siege. Evil was rooted and its followers driven deep into hiding. So as not to be caught unprepared again, the Knights established outposts like this one throughout the eastern lands. With that, the armies withdrew and, save for the Knights, were largely disbanded. All depend on our outposts. We are to be vigilant, to stamp out evil where we find it and, if dark plots threaten, to give advance warning to good folk everywhere. For all the confidence many felt when Sanction fell, things are not as they could be. Many of the good dragon eggs remain lost. Lord Soth stays secure and apparently untouchable in his fortress, although he provided no aid to the dragon armies in this last conflict. The knights on whom so much depends are stretched too thin. Indeed, it is all the knights can do to provide the outposts with leadership. The work of patrolling and the like falls almost entirely on ordinary folks such as ourselves. And if the other outposts are like this one, things may be much worse than they appear. Strange events have occurred. We hear rumors. Rumors of settler caravans killed or enslaved. Of a strange force that opens graves and robs the dead of evil dragons seen flying to the east, of entire cities captured and secretly enslaved. Our commandant sends out patrols and they report nothing. At least those who, have, who return have nothing to report. But of late not all sent out have been coming back. I know the commandant has been urged to report all this but he has refused to do so. The fact is that our commandant has not been himself lately. He looks the same and talks the same but his actions, his feel, are quite different. I fear some dreadful fate awaits us all. A fate we should be able to see, but which a dark veil is hiding. Ah, I babble. We are on the westernmost outpost below the deserted city of Throttle. Of all the outposts, we have the least to fear. My regards to our mother. Tell her I am safe and likely to remain that way. Your brother, Hell. Respectfully submitted for your consideration, Mothos Strongsword, Knight of Tears. <coughs> and with that, we conclude the first video and continue the next one. So thank you very much for watching and see you soon. Bye.